Hello, my name is Kevin Alcuni, and I'm a librarian here in the Department of Exploration and Creativity with the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made, writer Hector Tobar in conversation with journalist Alex Cohen. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for bring, helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like more of our amaze, if you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org/events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org/lamade. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Um, so there's lots of great stuff in there, so please check it out. Uh, but now into today's program, Hector Tobar in conversation with Alex Cohen. And as a reminder here, participants at today's program will have a chance to win a free copy of Hector's latest novel, The Last Great Road Bump. Just email the EC department at lapl.org for your opportunity to win a copy. And the email is right there for you to see. Hector Tobar is a Los Angeles-born author of five books that have been translated into 15 languages, including the novels The Taxied Soldier, The Barbarian Nurseries, and most recently, The Last Great Robum. The son of Guatemalan immigrants, he has been the Mexico City and Buenos Aires Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times, an op-ed writer for the New York Times, and a contributor to the New Yorker, Harper's, Smithsonian, and National Geographic. He will be in conversation with Alex Cohen, who is the host of the television show Inside the Issues on Spectrum News One, SoCal, and host of the podcast SoCal in, Se in 17. Prior to Spectrum, she spent nearly two decades in public radio working as a host, reporter, and producer with NPR, Marketplace, KPCC, and KQED. KQED. It's a lot of Ks. And now let's welcome to our LA Made stage, Hector Tobar and, and Alex Cohen. There'd be an actual big audience that would be like overwhelming us with so much applause, but you just got me in all the virtual eyes. So, but thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Kevin, for having us. It's my sincere pleasure to be doing this with you all virtually. Uh, Hector, such a phenomenal book. And just so it's, I really feel like in terms of its format, such a one of a kind for anyone watching today uh, who may not have had a chance to pick it up just yet. This is a kind of fictionalized story, but so deeply rooted in nonfiction. It almost reminds me like of an Adam McKay film in that there's a lot of truth and reality in here, but also some wonderful creative interpretation. And it all centers around a gentleman uh, from Champaign-Urbana named Joe Sanderson. So I was thinking, Hector, you could just kind of take us back to when and how you first heard of this guy. And if you can even remember a life without him being so thoroughly imbued in your life, what your first impressions of him were when you first learned of who he was? Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you for agreeing to be uh, my interviewer today. And thank you to Kevin and everybody at the library for putting this together. Um, in answer to your question, you know, I was working for the LA Times. I was a reporter for the LA Times for many years, and I was the Mexico City Bureau Chief. And um, I was, uh, you know, in my office in Mexico City, and I was also in charge of Central America. So I had a researcher in San Salvador, Alex Renderos, and I would talk to him every week. And he would tell me story ideas, basically pitch story ideas for me to come out and visit El Salvador. And one day he told me about having uh, heard about this gringos diary that was located in the Museum of the Revolution, a place called uh, El Museo de la Palabra y la Imagen, uh, located in San Salvador. And I said, well, send me a few pages, you know. And the story was that this gringo, his name was Lucas 
uh, was his nom de guerre, had uh, come and joined the revolution uh, in the 19, late 1970s and had died um, in 1982 in battle. And this was his diary. And I thought, oh, my God, a blonde Che Guevara, you know. And um, and Alex shipped me some pages, actually FedExed me some pages. Um, and then I asked him to get me the whole thing. And I ended up contacting Joe's brother, Steve, who was then living in South Carolina. Steve is a longtime employee for the University of Illinois, an accountant at the University of Illinois. And um, next thing I knew, I was researching this and writing a story for the Times that eventually became uh, this novel, The Last Great Road Bun. And I'm curious if there was a, a point in time where you realized, because obviously this is a remarkable story, such a one of a kind person, such a one of a kind experience. But of course, in the world of writing, there's so many different avenues, right? There's so many different channels. This could be like the Sunday New York Times magazine story you right, know, or whatnot. Right. Was there a moment where you said to yourself, this guy is a book. It really kind of has to be a book. And can you walk me through that process of, okay, making that decision and then deciding the particular way in which you would write this book? Because it's such an unusual construction. Yeah. I mean, right from the beginning, I thought this is a, this is a book. Uh, at first I thought it was a nonfiction book because, you know, the story of a North American man, especially one from a Midwestern town, uh, middle class family. His father was a was a professor. His mother was an accountant at the University of Illinois. Also, I thought you know that that story has to be and you know it has to be a, a book. And so I started writing a nonfiction book proposal, and I worked on it for a couple of years. You know, a nonfiction book proposal. You write about forty or fifty pages. You outline uh, what the book will cover and sort of give a sense of the tone of the book. But after working on this for more than a year, um, it just didn't really leap off the page. Uh, in the meantime, I got a contract to write a book on the Chilean miners who had been trapped in 2010. And I worked on that book for three years, put Joe on the back burner. And I, I, you know, after a while I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, Joe did all these crazy things. Joe hitchhiked around the world, took ships, uh, you know, uh, and uh, freighters and buses and trains around the world. Um, he did all these things, visited wars in Africa, went to the Vietnam War as a tourist, uh, did all these things because he wanted to write a novel. So if this guy did all these things because he thought that he could write a novel by having a life that was like a character in a novel, then maybe I should be the one to write the novel he could never write because Joe was never published in his lifetime. His manuscripts filled many boxes in his um uh, in his brother's uh, and his father's uh, homes and were never published and because they were very bad. Uh, and so I thought I should write the novel that Joe could never write. And so I started writing as a novel and then it really did come to life. And I just, you know, enjoyed so much the, the three or four years in which I was, um, you know, working with my, my version uh, of my resurrected version of Joe Sanderson, who of course died in battle at the age of 39 uh, in 1982. Yeah, which we'll talk about as well. But um, Hector, your answer just so perfectly cued up a passage that I thought you could read for us on the top of page 172. And as you're getting ready to do that, I just want to let our viewers know today, if you've got questions mm -hmm. for Hector about this book or any of his other books, uh, feel free to share them with us. And we will be asking him that throughout our event. So Hector, whenever you're ready, take it away. Yeah, this, this passage is one in which um, uh, Joe has submitted a manuscript to a publishing house in New York, and the uh, reader of the of the publish of the uh, work uh, is 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 thinking about you know having spent a, a couple of days reading this manuscript uh, because Joe has sent him a, a novel that he wrote that's set in Africa because Joe had gone to the war in Biafra, the war in Africa, uh, the Africa, the Nigerian Civil War, and so the the reader is reflecting and he says. Too bad most of the writing was so unpolished and unformed. A series of notes, really. Joe Sanderson filled page after page with sentence fragments and one ellipsis after another. Maybe 6,000 ellipses in the entire book. This guy Sanderson wears out the period key on his Olivetti. I can see him at the typewriter repair shop. It's not typing periods anymore. And there was the problem of Sanderson's unnamed protagonist and narrator, who was prone to long speeches, such as the one that followed the death of a newborn baby. Villagers trailing behind you on the riverbank, 
hungrily listening to your words, dot, 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 revolution, dot, 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 revolution, dot, 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 telling them to stop being victims, dot, 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 refuse the blame for their own misery, dot, 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 become defiant, dot, 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 get weapons, dot, 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 break their link in the chain of death. After that, the reader skimmed up to the last of the 316 pages, and he put the novel back in its box for the return trip to Urbana, Illinois. What was this Sanderson guy like? Maybe a white American man of about 35 with vertical worry veins on his forehead, troubled by all the suffering he'd seen in Africa, and also filled with a sense of his own inevitability as an author unaware that his lecturing of the natives was off-putting, an echo of the white man's burden. People could read African writers now, after all. There were many, many, more published in the U.S. every day, and the reader wondered if there might be an African novel in that pile next to the editor's desk. So that's that's Joe Sanderson's novel. <laughs> it uh, is, and I have to say, I've been so awkwardly aware of my own ellipses use after having read that passage and this book. Uh, we've got one of our first questions in from the audience. As you can see there, uh, Helene asking, how long was Joe's diary? And maybe if you could tell us a little bit, because I know having read the whole book, that it was there, uh, there were different parts of his writing in different yes. places. Maybe you can walk us through that. Well, the actual war diary that um, was... Uh, Joe was actually carrying when he died, when he died. Um, it was rescued by one of his friends, a uh, guy who worked on the rebel radio station, and then later was smuggled out of El Salvador as the war was going on to Nicaragua, uh, probably in a boat over the Gulf of Fonseca. That, that, that particular diary covered only about like three months, the last three months of Joe's life, and it was 349 pages long. And that was really the only specific war diary that I had. I also had letters that he wrote home during the war and during uh, his time with the guerrillas from El Salvador. Oftentimes they were postmarked from Honduras because a rebel courier would take him to Honduras across the border to mail them. But in addition to that, I had um, approximately three or 400 letters that Joe had written home from his many travels. And so the bulk of the novel really is about those letters, which were written mostly to his mother, and in which Joe never really pulled any punches, told his mother he was sm smoking marijuana with the Jamaicans in the hills of, above Kingston, uh, told her that he was sneaking in the foxholes outside of Saigon during the Vietnam War. He never really seems to me, he never really pulled any punches and uh, was, was pretty graphic in his letters home to his mom. And let's talk a little bit more about that relationship with his mother, Virginia. It's, I think, one of the most beautiful aspects of this book because there is the relationship that we have with him as a reader. And of course, you're invested in him and what happens to him because you're reading this book about him. And yet here is his mother who just seems to have so many different feelings for him. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about how you put herself, put yourself in, in her mind and how she must have related to what was happening with her son, what she knew and what she didn't know? Well, I was really fortunate when I was writing uh, this novel to have already um, at least one grown child and another one who was becoming grown as I was writing it. Um, you know, I now have two kids who are in their 20s, two sons who graduated from college and so, uh, you know, there's a scene, for example, there's a passage where Virginia hosts her son who's come back home to visit and she makes these meals for him and then he's gone and she's got a refrigerator filled with the leftovers. And that's me. I mean, that happened to me when my kids come and visit and you're, you know, for those days or hours that they visit you, you're just so filled with the happiness that your family is a unit again and they're you know adults and you can talk to them about you know what they've done or worry about them as virginia would do um and so a lot of that you know is is from my own experience um as as a parent uh, the other parts i never met virginia uh, virginia sanderson because um she died only a few years after joe did she had a heart attack um uh, in um in champaign urbana i never met her but i did interview her ex-husband joe's father and, you know, and so I heard one side of a divorce story 
um, <laughs> you know, and but learned a little bit about the relationship there and also the letters themselves. The letters themselves really reveal this um, wonderful um, relationship, this care, this open mindedness. You know, Virginia Sanderson was a Republican. You know, she was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, you know, very conservative, uh, you know, patriotic society. And her son uh, was eventually fighting with a Marxist army, <laughs> you know, uh, and they loved each other very, very deeply. And so um, it was just so it was wonderful to think of her as and also she was a professional, you know, she was a professional in a time when not, you know, not every woman could be a professional. She worked, um, she ended up becoming, uh, I think, a vice president uh, in a bank for a time uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in Urbana, Illinois. And so it was just really wonderful. You know, she's a, she's a figure in this period of American history when women have all of these sort of different uh, options that are evolving. You know, she goes from being a, you know, a housewife to being, uh, you know, uh, a university administrator and all these things. But, but, you know, the book is really about her relationship with her son. And, uh, and like I said, a lot of it is based on my own relationship with my adult children. And there are other women in Joe's life, quite a few as he travels around the world. And can you talk about, I mean, he definitely, he seems like he's this young, blonde, attractive guy and he meets these women, but it's, I don't know, it seems like with, it seems like there's a parallel almost with his writing. Like he can write, but he's not a writer and he meets these women and then he can't seem to quite have a relationship. What do you think that's all about? Well, yeah, I think he was um, he was someone who uh, had trouble with intimacy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why he left home, and um, uh, because he he was always in a place where everything was new, and he could be sort of the shining young sort of outsider, the handsome outsider. But I was very very fortunate that Steve Sanderson, Joe's brother, had been in contact with one of Joe's ex girlfriends. Uh, a woman who only go, wants to go by the name of Mafalda and who occasionally visits L.A. Um, and, she, and I interviewed her a few times at length. And she also she also gave me uh, many of the letters that Joe had sent her, um, you know, from from her tra from his travels. And so this story, which Mafalda gets pregnant in London in the middle of the book, uh, they meet before that on a ship. You know, they meet on a ship headed from from Lisbon to, to England, a ship that Joe had boarded originally in Brazil. Uh, all of that sort of this romantic, crazy um, scene that goes on on the ship. That's all stuff Mafalda told me. You know, <laughs> Joe had originally romanced another woman on the same boat, a British woman, and then broke up with her halfway on the voyage to be with Mafalda. And um, and they stayed in touch. And so, uh, so a lot, you know, so so a lot of that is is based on that interview and and just uh, on stories that I heard also from from Joe's friends about his relationships and um, and just yeah, it, there there was there's there's uh, and there you know he and but he was drawn also to very very strong women, women who were really intelligent, usually very well read um, or very strong physically. One, one of his uh, girlfriends was a construction worker in the 1970s, a time when not many women worked in construction. So, um, yeah, he, uh, it was, it was wonderful to see, uh, to, to be able to introduce the reader to these strong women characters. And then eventually, of course, you know, he ends up in the Salvadoran guerrilla movement, which in many ways is on one of my favorite lines in the book, uh, is that the revolution was in many ways a revolution for women's power, a defense of women's bodies against this dictatorship of, you know, composed of murderers and rapists. And so Joe meets these incredible women guerrilla fighters. You can go on, uh, you know, Google and Google images and, and, and see all these incredible images of these young women Salvadoran uh, fighters, some of peasant extraction, many of them university students, um, many of them very well educated. So, so Joe was always in one way or another uh, surrounding himself or finding himself uh, having these encounters with, with strong and intelligent women. In that same section, there was a really remarkable observation that I really enjoyed when, when Joe recognizes that, that all uh, these guerrilla fighters are looking at, at 
you know, girly magazines and there's these beautiful real life women right in front of them that right. they're just not even paying attention to. Um, I, the next question, it's so funny, just as I was about to ask, I noticed in case you didn't see in the comments, uh, Hector, we've got a note. Hi, Hector. Good to see you. We're so grateful that you shared Joe's story with the world courtesy of Steve Sanderson and Jenny, Joe's brother and his wife. And I'm curious when you talked and you mentioned interviewing Mafalda, when when you talked with these folks who knew Joe and you explained what you were doing, what, what was their reaction to, you know, here's this man who always wanted to write the great book of his own and that never happened. And yet they get a writer and not just any writer, they get Hector Dogar to tell that story. What did they say? Oh, I, everyone was so happy to to talk to me, you know, so happy to share. I will have to say that at first, Steve, uh, you know, Steve was a little doubtful and skeptical that I had actually, uh, you know, uh, been given uh, Steve's, uh, excuse me, Joe's, um, Joe's diary. He actually had me send him some pages. I FedExed him some pages or I faxed him some pages of the diary. And he said, oh, yeah, that's my brother's handwriting. Um, but, you know, and once we got to know each other, you know, Steve was an incredible help. I mean, everybody I met, I, I interviewed Jim Adams uh, for a day uh, in, in Champaign-Urbana, uh, who Joe's, was Joe's best friend in high school. He's the one who told me the story of uh, Joe climbing the, the water tower that then existed in the center of Champaign-Urbana uh, on the day that they, um, they covered the, the town with uh, stenciled images of the Playboy Bunny logo, right? Um, so everyone I met was was really really happy to to share their stories. Even the you know, and I have also the guerrillas in El Salvador, and you know the guerrillas in El Salvador knew him. They thought he was a Vietnam veteran. They thought he was kind of like this green beret that <laughs> just <laughs> defected or something. And they told incredible stories when I was doing the story for the LA Times uh, way back in two thousand and seven uh, of just what a great shot he was and the story of Joe teaching the Revel, the, the, these young men and women of the guerrilla army had to swim because many of them had never learned how to swim. And Joe had been a lifeguard at the Champaign-Urbana pool. Um, and so, uh, yeah, everyone see, was was really, really happy to talk to me about, about uh, Joe or Lucas or however they knew him. And let's talk about his role and, and the places that he played in El Salvador and the places that he traveled overall. I mean, I think, of course, probably you know, many of us have encountered in our real lives that person who just travels all over the world and goes to the fun places because they like the thrill and the adventure. The places that Joe chose to go to, it's just very different, right? It's a very rare example and choosing to fight with the, the soldiers, the guerrilla soldiers in El Salvador. I, you know, I don't want to give away too much for people who haven't read the book yet, but as far as you understand it, what, what was his motivation for that? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think there was a deep psychological motivation to, to prove himself and to get away from a place where he felt judged and where he was not, he was sort of lacking. Because you see, he was went to a really great high school, Urbana High School, class of 1960. One of his best friends in high school was Roger Ebert, the future film critic, Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, and, and Joe dropped out of college. Joe never graduated from college. He, he had left behind sort of the standard you know, middle-class professional life, uh, you know, his, his brother, uh, you know, ends up becoming a high-ranking administrator uh, at the University of Illinois. Um, and so Joe, uh, Joe doesn't, I think that he felt he didn't measure up on that level of achievement. And so getting away from that, he would go to places where nobody knew that about him. They just knew that he was a good-looking guy, was charming. Um, and he was also extremely good at being a road bum. You know, he could find places to stay. He could charm people into uh, into their <laughs> into his bed, or he could char charm himself into some family giving him a you know meals and rides and across Chile, across the deserts in Chile. And also, I think he you know he he also tried to sort of justify to his mother, especially, that he had a purpose, and his purpose was to write a book that he was a writer, and so he had to try and prove himself and. And Joe, um, since he really wasn't that much into revision and the discipline, the craft, the solitude of being a writer, 
he made up for that by just by trying to be bold and trying to do um, exciting things. Like, you know, he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, you know, in honor of Hemingway and went to Kenya in honor of Hemingway. He, you know, the war going to the war in El Salvador was an attempt to recreate For Whom the Bell Tolls, which is Hemingway's novel about the Spanish Civil War. Joe went to another civil war in a Spanish speaking country. So I think he um, he was trying to write a book. He was trying to prove himself to his mother. He was trying to get away from, you know, middle class life in the United States and his failure to sort of succeed in that. And he was also just really having a good time and doing something that he was really good at, um, which was traveling and road bumming. Speaking of the craft of writing, our next question uh, coming from our lovely host today, Kevin Awakuni, who's curious to hear a little bit about your writing process, how often you write, and whether or not music factors into the equation. Well, um, how often do I write and does music, I, I, when I listen, there are times, there have been times when I've, yes, routinely listened to music. Usually I listen to um, soundtracks from movies or classical music, something that doesn't have um, words in it because, of course, the words are distracting. Uh, or they could be words in a foreign language, but it, nothing with singing in English because I can't that, – that would sort of break my concentration. Um, so, yeah, I, I, ha I do listen to, I, to a lot of music, not so much lately. And usually I'm a very early morning writer. You know, the world is broken into uh, two camps – um, the early morning writers and the late at night writers. And, um, and I'm one of the sort of, you know, crack of dawn writers. And, um, you know, usually I don't write for more than a couple hours a day. Um, I, I, you know, usually it's getting 250 words, 500 words done in the day. 500 words would be a lot for a day. Usually it's more like 250 words. And just concentrating on the paragraph. Every day is the battle of the paragraph. Um, sometimes of a sentence. I think I write pretty slowly, but um, you know, I haven't written a book that's taken me less than three years, uh, and some ten years or longer. So it's it's the, usually that process of um, uh, you know every morning getting up and um, and just tackling whatever the scene or character um, or transition is of that day. Okay, now it's time for me to ask a super new age question. Hector, do you know what time of day you were born at? <laughs> and I'll tell you well, why. I have to sound a file someplace. No, I, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I think I was born at about 3.20 in the afternoon. Oh, that's fascinating. And this is one of those like old wives tale, but I've always been told that, that that if you were born in the morning, you're more productive in the morning. You can write because I'm the same way. I'm a morning writer writing in the evening destroys me but i was also born early in the morning so i just had to ask that so curious yeah. about such things um and now a very much more serious question about the use of footnotes in this book because one of the great ways that you're kind of able to delineate here's where joe is telling you the story and here's where hector's telling you the story is through the use of footnotes so can you kind of tell us a bit more about how you arrived at that as the way to go um, and, and what it allowed you to, like what you liked about it, what was frustrating about it, what the whole experience was like having that kind of dialogue through footnotes. Yeah. You know, the part of the um, problem with this book, uh, is that, you know, Joe lived in a much different time. So he lived, he traveled to the world approximately, let's say from 1962, uh, to 1982. And it was just, you know, the, the women's movement obviously was gathering power, but it hadn't really made the sort of change in perspective, right, <laughs> uh, in the mind of the American male that it would achieve in our times, <laughs> right, when gender roles have really, ideas of parenting and gender roles have changed so dramatically. Also, Joe lived at a time uh, when, you know, the, the, the white male narrative was sort of the dominant narrative in American literature. And so I wanted to sort of address that, all those things. I wanted to address um, the fact that the world had changed. And, um, and Joe, from wherever he is, is sort of aware of this. And so he can see that, um, that, that I'm, I'm taking, in, in my story, I'm making certain choices in the way I tell a story. 
um, because the world has changed. And so Joe comments on that. And in fact, I'm stealing his story. You know, that's that's a, you know undeniable fact. I've taken this dead man's work. He's not really in a position to defend himself, but I have given him a little chunk of my imagination and allowed that voice of Joe's to say, "Hey, wait a minute, this guy Tobar, like he just he just zoomed through like three years of my life, <laughs> right? Um, or he's telling these things that I didn't want anybody to know. You know, I didn't want anybody to know what happened with Mafalda in London. I was such a jerk. You know, a lot of people, uh, I think that they expect the, that um, they want the characters in their books to be nice people and not real people. And so a lot of people are kind of stunned at some of the stuff that Joe Sanderson does. Um, but he did them. And, you know, I think he, he, he did. He was still an incredible, amazing human being someone I would have loved to have sat down with and have a, a lunch or a dinner or one drink or several. And so uh, a lot of that just comes from wanting to sort of have Joe's spirit in the book. So Joe is, and I love the idea of this little space in the footnotes and Joe Sanderson looking up at the manuscript and speaking from the footnotes. I just love that idea. And I'd never, I'd never seen that in a book before. So I thought, well, let me give it a shot. And um, and take a risk for once, <laughs> not be the not be the guy who plays it safe because you know journalists were trying to sort of be taken safe and you know, and just do something really crazy, and um, and so I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I had to, I you know, I had to almost sort of rein myself in it at one point. Um, so yeah, so and, and I also really you know uh, it all comes too from this idea I had originally for. A first sentence in the novel, which was now sort of is in the novel at the very beginning. Uh, Hello, my name is Joe Sanderson, and you are about to read the book that killed me. <laughs> that's that's the uh, that's the opening to the book, and so that voice of his, that first person voice of Joe Sanderson looming over my novel, uh, is is filtered throughout the book in these crazy footnotes. And the other thing that this format allowed you to do pretty early on is kind of, you know, nip something in the bud, which is to say, you know, especially here in in the year and the era that we're living in, one could raise the question, hey, there's so many books about blonde white dudes out there. Do we really need another one? And do we really need a one from the son of Guatemalan immigrants? So you kind of, I, I mean, I want to say it's within the first 20, 30 pages, you're able to get to that. And can you share a little bit of, of what your thought was there? And if you had any qualms of like, okay, of all the things no. to write a book about, is this really where I want to go? No, absolutely. I, I had a lot of qualms and I still have them. <laughs> you know, did I, what did I do for four years of my life? Um, you know, yeah, I think that it's really difficult because, you know, Joe's book landed um, this book landed, this novel landed um, during, you know, the pandemic and during the George Floyd spring. And um, and here is a novel about a white man. And I wanted to yell to the world, you know, but wait, no, 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 it's not real. It's a novel by a Latino writer about a white guy. <laughs> you know, and part of it is just I just feel like writers should be able to do uh, whatever he or she or they want to do. And uh, and to me. What I really, really loved about this novel was that it gave me the opportunity to tackle American history and American identity because I was born in the United States. I'm a son of Guatemalan immigrants. Uh, Joe gave his life fighting for the liberty of Central America, right? My family's from Central America. And I thought, you know, uh, this is a nice circle that we're closing together. And so, yeah, you know, and I, I, time and again, I tell people what I was working on and people would look at me like I was crazy. I mean, you know, there are just certain things that you're not, that you're supposed to write about uh, when you're a, a Latino artist, a Latinx artist, a Latinx novelist, and this is not one of them. Um, but, you know, I really, I just felt like it's where my imagination wanted to take me. And I have to say, I just felt so powerful when I was writing Joe and his family, because our this United States is an amazing country. You know, I went to Champaign-Urbana many times, college town, flattest place in the United States, you know, and I'd go there and I'd tell people, this is an amazing place. This is like the woods and the university and all these people and the, the Sangamon River and all these things. And people would look at me like I was a lunatic. 
<laughs> you know, um, but I just loved the Midwest. I loved losing myself in the Midwest and that Midwestern way of being, you know, the very reserved, very, um, very um, kind of polite and friendly, a little bit untrusting of outsiders, um, you know, very democratic. People have this sense of like, not democratic with a big D, but with a small D, this sense of equality and fairness. Fairness, the idea of fairness is all through Joe's letters. You know, the people here in Nigeria, they're getting a bad deal. They're getting a raw deal. The Salvadoran people, they're getting a raw deal because he was raised with this notion of fairness. So to me, to be able to write about these American values of democracy and fairness, of what we're raised to think of, you know, when we are young men and women growing up in the United States and the reality of American imperialism, which Joe saw again and again, right? Be it in Africa, be it in Asia, he saw the effects of American power of the American empire on the United States, uh, excuse me, on, on the rest of the world and, and on American families too. So, so that's why I tackle this sort of crazy subject and, um, you know, I, I, it's caused me a lot of grief, I have to say, um, just because I worry about it. You know, your book is like this child and, you know, I'm afraid that, that, that they're not going to like him because he's a white guy. <laughs> well, it's complicated, right? It's all complicated. Right, it's complicated. Even, yes. Even what you just said about democracy with a little D, I, it's actually a perfect point to ask you about. And it was just this tiny little glimmer of something, but it really stuck with me when one of the, the guys in El Salvador that Lucas, jo, uh, Joe's adopted nom de guerre, uh, is fighting alongside is kind of comparing and contrasting the ideals and the freedom of the United States with what they're where they're at in El Salvador and brings up, I believe it's a girlfriend or a sister, forgive me, Hector, but I think you know what I'm talking about, who's who is proof that maybe the USA is not as much of the beacon as freedom as we all hoped. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit about that passage, because I thought it was just, it was so chilly and there was so much that was going on and so much I was thinking about. And it was just like an even more of a little oomph kind of, wow, that's chilling moment. Yeah, I really, I really loved this. Um, you know, the thing with a novel is you have to be able to do things. A novel can do things that no other form can do. And so in a certain sense, we're looking into the future. And it happens more than once uh, in the Salvadoran sections of the book. Um, there's another passage in which a guerrilla leader, a mad, you know, can see the future of El Salvador, can see this violent future even after the war is over. And so that was a passage in which uh, I, I sort of sped up time and looked into the future. And this man is remembering his his relationship with Joe Sanderson and wants to ask him, are is your fam is is your country ever gonna let go of my wife? She went away and she she's never come back. And um, and so yeah, that was a, a way to sort of incorporate this larger story of El Salvador. You know, El Salvador is a country that has suffered so much has such incredibly brave and powerful people. The revolution itself, I mean, the, the, the novel is meant to celebrate the incredible inventiveness, you know, of, of the Salvadoran people. They, um, you know, they, they pulled up this revolution from scratch, you know, it was such, um, such inventiveness. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I just really enjoyed celebrating all of that, these aspects of, of, of Salvadoran history. Uh, and and the Salvadoran present, right? Um, the improvisation. I think that's what Central Americans are really famous for to this day is our ability to improvise, to make something out of nothing. And so all of those things I wanted to celebrate in, in, in those passages. I, I want to bring in two questions from our audience. One from SJG, how many books have you written? And another one mm -hmm. from Monica Valencia, did you consult an entomologist when you wrote your book? Because there are, in fact, a lot of references to butterflies and beetles. Great question, Monica. Okay, so I've written five books so far published, and I just finished the sixth which is in the hands of my agent and my editor and might come out in 2023 if I'm lucky. Um, and in terms of a, a, you know, consulting an, uh, uh, an entomologist, yes, I did, because Joe Sanderson's father was an entomologist. 
And so um, that's one of the reasons why when Joe, Joe was a child, he collected butterflies. And that's how the novel begins. Because in real life, Joe did collect butterflies. In real life, his butterflies are still in the collection of the Illinois Natural History Survey. Uh, because his father helped place them there after Joe had sort of stopped his collecting days. So I spent a lot of time with, uh, with um, Milt Sanderson. Uh, who at the time I interviewed him, which was not too long before he died, he was about 100 years old. He was 100 years old. And uh, Milt Sanderson was the world's leading uh, expert on the June beetle. Uh, and so, you know, we talk about butterflies and beetles. And I, you know, I did a, <laughs> and, and I did a lot of, I did a lot of butterfly and beetle research. Um, that was originally my title was going to be the battlefield adventures of a butterfly collector, but I thought that was a little bit too long. Uh, and because later, it's very funny when Joe was in El Salvador, he's writing letters home to um, to his father, and he's using all of this strange code. So he refers to the guerrilla fighters as entomologists, right? He tells, he says, "Oh, here I am with my fellow." Actually, no, he says, "My fellow lepidopterists." Right, a lepidopterist is specifically a butterfly, you know, collector of, of uh, scientist, uh, you know. And here we are with our butterfly nets, which he meant, you know, M16s rifles. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of butterfly imagery throughout the book, and um, because Joe loved butterflies, uh, he was uh, he collected them as a boy, and and they became symbols for him throughout his life for uh, for different things. It is a beautiful theme throughout the book. And I'm going to just remind folks here that there is an email address that I believe our host will share if you want to get a copy of this fantastic book. Uh, Hector, there is there. It is right there on the bottom of your screen if you'd like to get a copy, ecdept at lapl.org. Hector, especially towards the end of the book, there's this really kind of beautiful, I think, mystical notion of spirits inhabiting other bodies, which is referred to when uh, these uh, revolutionaries start perishing on the fields, they kind of, there's this notion that they start inhabiting the bodies of the living. And as I was reading about it, I was like, oh, and this is kind of what's been going on in the book all along is Joe inhabits Hector and Hector inhabits Joe. Mm. I'm just really like, just talk to me about that. And when that became part of the story for you, um, and yet just how you feel about it, because it definitely was a very powerful theme to bring. In. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, that that particular passage that you first mentioned happens after the massacre at El Mosote. So the massacre at El Mosote is one of the worst massacres in the history of the Western Hemisphere and certainly in the 20th century in the Western Hemisphere. Um, several hundred people killed by a Salvadoran army unit. Um, inside the hamlet of El Mosote and other surrounding hamlets. And so um, so Joe was there, Joe and his unit of the FMLN, um, they, were, they were there within a few days afterwards. Or actually, maybe it was about a week afterwards. And they marched through and they saw this horrible massacre. And it's after that, that a lot of the, you know, guerrilla fighters kind of freak out um, because they're, they, there's this sort of folk wisdom that when when someone dies, they they try to incorporate in, enter somebody else's body, and so um, so I had a lot of um, I got a lot of mileage in that particular uh, passage. In the passages that follow, as these men and women deal with the incredible trauma of having seen such a horrific sight, because you know I mean it's it's one of, I, it's one of the most horrific things. You know they they herded the children into a into a church and you know, and set the church on fire. And, um, and so uh, just the, the horror of that um, it's, it's a way of dealing with the horror of that, you know, and, um, and I had never really thought about that as being sort of a metaphor for what happens throughout the book. So thank you for saying that. I, I'd like to say that I planned that, but, but that was a little piece of folk wisdom that I think I remember hearing from the compañeros when I was in El Salvador all those years ago. Uh, another question from Kevin, when you're interviewing your subjects, how long and how often are these sessions and how long does it take you then to transform those words into usable book stuff? 
Well, it all depends, you know, how, how, how much time you have them for, uh, how important they are to you. Uh, you know, when I did my book on the Chilean miners, um, the, my previous book to this one, Deep Down Dark, I interviewed one of the miners, uh, Mario Sepulveda, for something like uh, 14 or 15 hours, you know, over many, many interviews. Um, and uh, but oftentimes you only have somebody for 20 minutes and 30 minutes. And um, and I think, yes, uh, you end up with a, you know, a really, really stick, thick stack of material. I have, you know, boxes and boxes of notes from interviews uh, on the Joe Sanderson book and, of course, all of his letters. And the truth is, as a writer, you just use a small fraction of the stuff, you know, uh, especially in my Chilean miners book. You know, of all the interviews I did, I probably used less than half of one percent of all the interviews that I did. You know, um, just because, um, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages, single spaced of material and the book's 300 pages long. Um, and, uh, you know, and so you, you just use a small fraction. Uh, and that's the thing is to have is to is to think like an artist and you have all of this material before you that someone has shared with you. And um, and then you, you know, you think of it as this sort of it's your paint box and which paint, you know, which paint am I going to use? Right. Uh, which material here can I throw on this canvas? Um, and, it, you know, with, uh, <laughs> with one of my previous book on the Chilean miners, I wrote 100 pages at the beginning of the novel that my editor told me to cut out. And I just cut them out and threw them away. And with this novel, I originally, my original manuscript was something like almost 200,000 words long. And what ended up, you know, being published is 120,000 words and always constantly sort of paring things away. Um, so... You know, the thing is that you're really thinking not about the facts as much as you're thinking about the emotional truths, you know? And so the emotional truth is the most important thing. And and the facts are important to you if they serve that emotional uh, engine that you're trying to create, you know? So uh, it's it's a process that involves tons and tons of gathering up stuff and then a lot of pulling away and a lot of discipline. So this is, I would say it's a spoiler alert, but as you mentioned at the beginning of this book, we all know that at some point Joe is going to die. And he has in his notes and in your interviews with people, I'm sure there was so much about his life and his travels that you do know, as you just mentioned, you know, so much of it has to be weeded out. Writing, I have to say, as I got closer and closer to the end of the book, I just had this like, this feeling of suspense of like, oh my God, I know he's going to die, but how do you write that? How do you actually write a person, especially knowing he's going to get killed on the battlefield? Like clearly he's not going to like sit down and journal about it later. It's this very intimate moment. Can you talk? I don't want to necessarily spoil any of the details of his death no, itself, no. but how you approached writing that death. And I, I if, if I were writing this book, that would be the part that would really terrify me. Well, first of all, you know, um, I was aided tremendously by the fact that I interviewed the doctor who treated him and was with him when Joe died. Uh, he's a doctor who didn't want his real name revealed when I wrote the story for the LA Times. I interviewed him. It so happened he was a doctor in Mexico City. He was a Mexican doctor who was joining the revolution, had joined the revolution. And he described to me the really, really poor conditions and said that if Joe had had that injury anywhere else, but in a, you know, in the middle of a guerrilla war, he would have survived it and, you know, and been fine. Um, and so, you know, I heard, I knew what Joe's last words were and, um, you know, what his last moments were. And um, so that was a really key part of the equation. Um, also, I interviewed um, the, you know, the, the, the one of the, the guerrilla radio operator who described to me the way they carried Joe and other, in fact, I think I, I interviewed some some men who knew the people who had carried him, right? And they described the spot where they buried him. So there was all of that material um, to deal with. And then there was Joe and the Joe that I knew, right? Because unlike the people who were with him when he died, I knew Joe's entire story. You know, I knew Joe. I had been with Joe back since his childhood in my imagination. And so my, my job was to, um, to be in that emotional space and to write that. Um, to, to become Joe in his final moments. And I have to tell you, I remember exactly where I was, where I, when I finished that, I was, I had rented 
Um, I was in an apartment in New York, you know, an Airbnb in New York for a few days. And I, I, I remember writing those final sentences of, of Joe's life and just weeping when I, you know, when I, when I, when he died, when he died on me, <laughs> you know, um, and also it was really important. Another thing related to that is that I was able to tell Steve, Joe's brother, how Joe died and what his final moments were like. And that was way back when I was starting the book. And so to be able to do that really gave closure to Steve and his family. Um, Because, you know, Steve told me that before you told me that how Joe had died and what his last moments were like, his last day was like, his last hours, I thought he could still come in the door, you know, because they had had no death certificate. They didn't know he was buried. All they had was this rebel announcement that an American had died. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was an emotional experience. I think a, a big part of that emotion is the fact that he he wanted to go home. You know, he, did, he at that point was kind of, it seems like, awakened to the fact that he, he was just ready to leave. And yet he kind of couldn't. Why was yes. that? Well, he, I, you know, it's, uh, that's a really, I think that's a political question uh, that the FMLN, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, there, I didn't talk to, I didn't talk to the actual commanders who were in charge of that sector you know i talked to a lot of people in the in the unit the units he was in but i'm pretty sure it was because they saw him as this valuable resource and they didn't want to let him go you know to have an english speaker to have someone you know joe had, had done his service with the u.s army so he was familiar with u.s military you know basic u.s military procedures i think it was too valuable to them uh to, to let him go and um, and that, I think, is the primary reason. And that and just, you know, things moving very slowly, you know, the, the rebel bureaucracy, the rebel, you know, command, you know, a chain of command is this was this incredibly made up thing where, you know, I mean, you know, they're all in different parts of the country and the commander in chief sometimes sneaks out and goes to Europe and to raise funds. And so, you know, all of these decisions were very slow and complicated and it's a war zone. And, you know, Joe said time and again, he was ready to go. Um, but, but they held on to him uh, and they held on to him unfortunately too long. And he, and he eventually died in, in battle. A, a question of, do you use your local uh, Los Angeles public library often? And I'm going to add, if so, how? Yes, I use my library um, all the time. I, I usually go to the LA uh, Central Library uh, is the one I consider to be my home branch. Also, uh, if there's something that I can see that I is in my local branch, which is here in Highland Park, um, because I live in Mount Washington, I'll go. Here's my library card. So you can tell my little fob library card. <laughs> I grew up going to um, the Hollywood branch of the public library um, before it was renovated. Uh, and my father, when he first came to the United States, when I was a little baby, would go to the Coenga branch in East Hollywood off of Santa Monica Boulevard. So my life is very much tied to the L.A. public library system. You mentioned uh, earlier that you would love to have had the opportunity to sit down with Joe, have a meal with Joe, get drinks with Joe. I'm curious if there are any questions that his journals, your research just couldn't provide that you're like, oh, if I could just ask him this. Um, and what writing tips? You know, you teach writing, you are a writer. <laughs> if you could, in the most gentle way possible, say, Joe, here's what could have helped you out, what that, what that would have looked like. I think I really would have loved if he had survived the war and I'd been able to help him write his Salvadoran memoir. I think that would have been an incredibly uh, wonderful process. Um, I think I could have helped him a lot in that. I think, um, uh, you know, for his fiction, I would have just, you know, taught him to uh, revise and taught him to be more patient. Uh, what would I have liked to ask him? I'd like to ask him what he thought of the book. You know, that's what I'd like to ask him. Hey, Joe, what do you think of the book? You know, is it, was it okay? Did I get, what did I get wrong? And what did I get right? And, um, and um, did you like it? I think that's what I, I would most like to talk to him about and, and know. Um, I think I'd like to really know what he did in the Vietnam War. I think there's one passage where, you know, I mean, I knew that he had imitated a journalist. I'd like to have, 
I'd like to have fleshed that out a little bit more and asked him more about what he did. Because what I know about the Vietnam War is one letter he wrote home, two letters he wrote home to his mother uh, about um, things that he did, which were really just stunningly crazy things that he did. But I'd like to know more about those things and probably, uh, you know, more about his travels through Afghanistan. It turns out that uh, I found out later when the New York Times did New York Times did the review that um, he had crossed paths with um, with the famous, he wasn't there, they weren't there at the exact same time, but Paul Thoreau, the famous travel writer, had been in some of the same places in Afghanistan that Joe was in. And I'd like to talk to him about Afghanistan. So many questions. Um, you know, I had to use my imagination. I had to answer those questions for me. But Paul Thoreau used fewer ellipses, so therefore yes. a much better <laughs> chronicler of his experience. Another question about uh, whether or not any time in your life you have been to El Salvador uh, and experienced the surroundings where Joe was. Well, yes. I mean, um, as I mentioned, I did go to Morazan province, which is in northeastern El Salvador, where this these scenes of the revolution took place, where Joe was in the Revolutionary Army. Um, now, before that, as a kid, I went to El Salvador. I was in El Salvador just before the revolution started. I was a teenager uh, in the in the mid nineteen seventies, and my father was a ham radio operator. He had lots of friends in um, in El Salvador, and we traveled actually throughout the whole country. So um, I had these memories of El Salvador as a kid, and then um, I was able to to tap in into all of these revolutionary memories. I went to Perkin which is the provincial capital, if I'm not mistaken, of Morazan province. And there's all these former rebels who have settled there. Many of them were university students from other parts of El Salvador. I got to spend a lot of time with them and listen to their stories. Uh, the story that's in the novel about the um, time when the cooks rebelled uh, against the sexism of the fact that all the cooks were women and that, uh, and that Joe you know, volunteered to cook and then turned out to be a terrible cook. All of that um, I heard from the compañeras when I was in uh, in Morazan province. Um, so yeah, I, I've been to Salvador many times. That area is sort of like, uh, Morazan is very, very mountainous and sort of like the Alps of, of, um, of El Salvador. Um, and yeah, and El Salvador is a beautiful country with, uh, with a kind of tough history but just incredibly strong and optimistic people. And I've, I've loved my visits to El Salvador. We've got a few minutes left and I don't know if you can answer this question. So if not, I totally understand. Uh, but you were mentioning that your newest baby is in the hands of your agent and hopefully will be <laughs> out uh, next year. Can you tell us anything about it? And uh, if not, maybe just to, what it was like working on that after writing this book. Well, yeah, my, my next book is called Our Migrant Souls, and it's a nonfiction, uh, a, it's a book of nonfiction that attempts to make sense of what it means to be Latino in an age of intolerance. And it's about um, raising uh, a family of, of Latino kids in a, in a time of, you know, so much racism and hatred, but also, most importantly, about being a university professor and a teacher um, in, in this time and, and seeing my students write so many stories about, about their experiences growing up as, you know, Salvadoran Americans, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Peruvians, Dominicans, um, in this, um, time of just, you know, in which Latino people are seen as this, uh, you know, barbarous horde that's, uh, threatening the stability of the United States. And, um, and it's an attempt to, to make sense of that and to, to see the history of being, uh, Latino and racialized ideas of what Latino is Latino means uh, in the history in the context of the history of the United States and the way the United States has um, constructed uh, race ideas. So a lot of it builds on the work done by so many great African American scholars who've written about um, racial formation and whiteness, uh, including the great historian Nell Irvin Painter, among others. So that's what my book is.
Well, I know I, for one, cannot wait to read it. These are definitely dark mm -hmm. times and so grateful for your bright light on a topic like that. Um, and hopefully, let's just maybe rendezvous once again, in, I don't know, about a year or so and have another chat about that one with the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you so much again to Hector Tobar for this beautiful book and your precious time and my thanks to the LA Public Library, which is helping so many of us right now get through a very difficult chapter in history. And thanks for everyone who showed up this afternoon. Thank you, Public Library. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <Whoop. laughs> Thanks to everybody. That was that was an incredible conversation. Really appreciated it. And uh, thank you, the audience, so much for joining us for today's LA May program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next LA May program on Thursday, January 27th at 4 p.m., The Shady Divide. In sunny Los Angeles, a lack of tree cover in low-income areas has left many residents vulnerable to rising heat. It's a, leg it's a legacy of the city's design as well as its history of racist policies. Journalist Alejandra Borunda documented this shady divide in a cover story for National Geographic, and we'll talk about the history that led to the shade inequity across the city, the heat-related dangers arising from a lack of tree canopies in poorer areas, and some of the ways people are trying to fix this problem now. So until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you very much. <laughs>